What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Gigi, author of 21 Lessons, What I've Learned from Falling Down the Bitcoin Rabbit Hole. Gigi is an engineer. His background is in computer science and software development. In a previous life, Gigi was part of a research group that tried to make computers think and reason, among other things. In yet another previous life, he wrote software for automated passport processing systems and related stuff, which is even scarier. He knows a thing or two about computers and our networked world. Welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast, Gigi. How are you? Hey, Cedric. Thanks for having me. I'm doing just fine. How are yourself? I'm doing great. You know, I, I do on a personal note, uh, I have to thank you. Uh, I know this conversation has been a long time in the works. Um, and you actually gave me really great advice uh, when I kind of postponed our last opportunity to talk. And you told me to take a breath. Uh, catch myself for a minute. And, and I really appreciated that. It, it really struck a chord. Um, it's amazing that you can meet somebody online and, and they can give you words of wisdom and, and it, it can speak to what's actually going on in your life. Maybe more so than some other words that are coming from other different directions. So I, I really appreciated that. It, it really sunk with me. I'm, I'm glad it helped. I just want to share this wisdom that was passed on to me by another Bitcoiner as well. And uh, in the Bitcoin space, a lot of people forget that um, you know, what is true for Bitcoin is true for the ecosystem as well. And as Satoshi said, nodes can leave and join the network at will. And that's true for people as well. You know, Bitcoin will still be here and uh, it's quite easy to catch up, I would say. And if you need a break for a couple of weeks or months, um, Bitcoin won't be going away. And I, I also think you you won't be, if you understood the fundamentals, you won't be missing much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean... Uh, to be honest, uh, it was a crazy time in my life, and uh, I've actually taken a leave from work since then to, to just catch myself, catch a break, take a breath. Um, and I've still kept up with the Bitcoin stuff. Uh, that just seems to be baked into my everyday existence. But uh, I really just needed that moment, and I, I appreciated that you were able to sh you know, share those thoughts with me, be patient with me, but also cut through some of the noise uh, and, and provide some signal. So, Yeah, of course. I mean, you know... Uh... It, it doesn't help anyone if if people burn out or if you know like <laughs> it, it just there, there is no use in in killing yourself and uh, I think uh, in the hectic times of today a lot of people tend to forget that but yeah it's, it's good to disconnect from time to time and just take a deep breath and realize that things are going to be fine <laughs> on that note it's interesting I mean these are very heady times uh, especially in the macro sense but even in the micro sense, I mean, things seem to be moving very quickly for you. Um, really just in, the, in sort of in, in the mind share, I feel like, you know, you were recently on uh, John Ballas's Bitcoiner book club and you guys had this awesome conversation about Jordan Peterson's book. And, and there was just a lot of attention thrown your way and, and to the whole group. And I remember you even tweeting about having to just go take a walk to let it all sink in. Uh, so... Yeah, it can be overwhelming at times, um, but it's also... Um, it's not it's not of our own making, you know, like Bitcoin has this kind of gravity and works in these kind of bursts where a lot of people get interested. And uh, this cycle, like now the last couple of weeks and months in particular, it seems that a lot of public intellectuals got interested in, in Bitcoin and Jordan Peterson being one of them. And he actually reached out to us after we had this book club conversation that John initiated. And I was just very lucky to, to be part of that. And I'm, I'm still very grateful that I know so many awesome people in the space. And uh, John hit me up like the night before if I want to if I want to uh, jump on and discuss the book mm. because he knew that I've read it. And um, I, I initially I was like, ah, oh man, I've got so many things to do. I think I'll pass. And mm -hmm. then last minute I, I changed my mind and, and said, okay, I'll, I'll hop on. I've, I've read the book twice. I think I can talk about it a little bit. And yeah, so it, it seems that we got swept up in, in this, um, yeah, in this wave of attention. And it, it's, it's funny to, kind of be part of that but it's also you know every i think every bitcoin or most bitcoiners at least have to realize that that they're just part of riding this wave 
and Bitcoin is doing its thing. Like it's, um, yeah, I, <laughs> you know, we did the same kind of things three or four years ago and nobody was interested. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden uh, everyone seems to be interested. And I think also the interest will, will fade away naturally uh, again. You know, it's, it sure. seems to be that way. You know, you bring up cycles and attention and mania. And, you know, I wonder like, how long have you been looking at Bitcoin? And I'm not really getting at your rabbit hole story, but like how many cycles have you been through? And, you know, is it easier for you if you've been through more than one or two to kind of, uh, so making an assumption there, but to kind of ride through the cycles on a macro level, uh, maybe it doesn't seem as exciting or uh, you're just used to this ride. Is, is that something you feel? Hmm. I, I'm, I don't think it has anything to do with, with um, the length or, or or the number of cycles you've been through. I don't know. I don't know if it's true. Mm. I mean, I'm 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 kind of late to Bitcoin, all things compared. Uh, I I don't consider myself an OG by any stretch of the imagination. Like um, I. Uh, I was primed to get in very early, but I didn't. Like I, I, I was such a slow learner. I was, I was so stubborn. I, I thought I knew too much. Like I, I, I thought I knew my computer science, and uh, I thought I knew why Bitcoin can never work. Like mm. I, I thought I knew that digital scarcity is an oxymoron, and it, it, it just can't be true. You know, like it can't work. It, it will get hacked, and, and all of that. So I think my first contact was in like late 2013 early 2014 and it took me forever to to uh, dig deeper and i as i've talked before uh, on conicarus's podcast i i went deep down the shitcoin rabbit hole like i was i was all in uh, in, in terms of unstoppable code and world computers and all those interesting yep. things that people uh, are still trying to do you know and uh, i just didn't understand why this um is kind of meaningless and and can never work in the first place and uh, i was just missing a lot of the background that is needed to truly understand bitcoin and so it took me a while to take a second look so my second look kind of started in late 2015 and uh, then it took me probably like two and a half or three years to catch up just on the economic side alone and mm. realize that this is about money and not about technology. Yeah. And uh, to answer your question in regards to um, if it's easier to, to write these kind of waves, I think, I think, I think I had a point where Bitcoin completely broke me. And once you are, once you hit rock bottom, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's very easy to do everything else. <laughs> like once Bitcoin completely, completely breaks you and spits you out on the other side, uh, I think every, everything that comes after that is, is just a walk in the park. Yeah. I mean, I, I really agree with what you're saying about, you know, when I came to Bitcoin in 2017, I thought about it as computers, networks, as just an, an evolution of existing technology. And in some ways it is, but I really got excited about the technology. And that was where the first rabbit hole I went down. And that obviously leads to shit coins. Uh, I don't have as much patience for shit coins now, four years later, um, maybe because of the cycle I've gone through. And I just had this expectation that everyone understands what we've learned over the last four years. But I think it's really easy to fall into the technology at first. You just, you, you don't see the other, um, I mean, we live in a technological world. We're in the tech age. And, and you just think this is an extension of that. Um, you, you know, you mentioned in, in the beginning of the book that you dedicate uh, your book to the, your wife, your child, and all the children of this world. May Bitcoin serve you well and provide a vision worth fighting for. What, what is that vision to you that we should be fighting for? I think Satoshi tried to solve various problems at once, and it depends on how you look at Bitcoin, mm. what kind of vision you want to fight for in particular. But I think... Um, one of the things is just move away from the panopticon, the digital mm -hmm. panopticon we're currently building. So we have just global digital surveillance and I don't think this is a good thing. I don't think the world is a safer place because of it. Um, the second thing is, of course, uh, which is the, the great narrative of, of our days now, um, sound money, just reintroducing sound money. Uh, what also Hayek talked about, you know, Bitcoin is this sly roundabout way to take um, the money away from the government. And so it is the separation of 
of money and state. And it's not only separating money and state, it's reintroducing sound money. And it's not only reintroducing sound money in terms of moving back to gold standard or something that approximates a gold standard. It, it introduces this, the soundest money the world has ever seen and arguably even the soundest money the world will ever be. Uh, will ever see because it's very hard to beat absolute scarcity. And I also think that absolute scarcity can only exist in the digital realm. And I also think it can't be replicated because you kind of have to, it has to come out of nowhere, you know, to have a kind of fair distribution and to um, distribute it organically. Now there are so many eyes on the digital value space. It, you, you cannot replicate this fair launch that Bitcoin had. And also nobody tries to replicate it in the first place, you know, like every single other project has a pre-mine or something similar. And um, so, so that's the return to a sound monetary system is definitely a, a vision worth finding, fighting for as well. And I think the, the third kind of thing is moving away from this centralized structure that we've built from our for ourselves especially online you know like mm -hmm. everything the internet in in the 80s and 90s it it had this utopian vision of just everyone can you know um interconnect and everything like information will be shared freely and you have uh, a thousand libraries of Alexandria on everyone's computer and, and stuff like that. And we saw how the internet got captured by very large monopolies in the form of Google and Facebook and others. And uh, it's, I think Bitcoin can also be seen as a force that enables the move away from this centralization. And it just, it enables a decentralized uprising in the first place. And yeah, those are the, the three things that that make me very hopeful. And I can't even tell you which one of those three is the most important. Yeah. Like arguably right. most people talk about the sound money currently, yeah. Yeah. but I think all of them are equally important. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the way you kind of summed it up for me is that Bitcoin solves three problems at once, inflation, surveillance, and micropayments. Uh, for me, they make sense in that order. I think inflation is the thing that I... Uh, is my biggest problem in my life right now, more than mm -hmm. surveillance. Um, uh, I, you know, the surveillance is kind of like a fish in water to me right now. Uh, I'm being constantly surveilled. I've been used to it. But I feel that if we solve the, so the sound money problem, that the surveillance will, will like sling back on it as well. And then the micropayments is almost like the third thing for me. But it was the first thing when it came to Bitcoin, you know, technology, yeah. payments, uh, shit coins. And, and I think that also gets slingshot uh, way higher in priority as we go through this these stages. Um, but yeah, I agree that most Bitcoiners are probably focused on inflation now and sound money, but all these, these three things are huge and they have so many second and third order effects to them that are beyond, you know, what my vision right now, uh, as we tackle these things. And it's interesting, you know, there was a tweet by uh, Anun Balaji that I think inspired you to write this book. And this, this tweet says, Bitcoin is a game designed to teach you about ethics of money production History of Central Banking and Gold, Adversarial System Design, Commodity Markets, Distributed Systems Engineering, and Software's Life Cycle, Security Laws. And then you set out to you know, answer this. What have you learned from Bitcoin? And I'd love to get into the, into the book a lot right now. And you know, the first chapter really covers like philosophical teachings and the interplay of immutability and change, the concept of true scarcity, Bitcoin's immaculate conception, the problem of identity, the contradiction of replication and locality, the power of free speech and the limits of knowledge. But I'd love to just kick off with that first one. You know, Bitcoin is inherently hard to describe, but why would you say that decentralization and immutability are the two aspects that are absolutely essential to Bitcoin? Yeah, so um, the first kind of chapters are really short because as you correctly said, what prompted me to write all this was this one tweet. And I tried to summarize my thoughts in a tweet actually and this tweet uh, turned into multiple tweets and the tweets then turned into an article and um yeah long story short i, I kind of was forced to put it all into a book because people uh, really liked it and they like many people reached out to me and were like hey i, I really want to buy this as a book and i <laughs> i was like okay then I, I guess i'll turn it into a book and so this, this is how 21 lessons was was born but um the the first like i, I I started with the philosophical thoughts I had on Bitcoin because I 
I think they are the most interesting ones because mm. Bitcoin is such a new thing that our current ways of thinking about money and thinking about um, all kinds of things, actually, um, they, they don't make sense in the Bitcoin world. And so the, the, the first lesson is about immutability and change. And it, it is a play on trying to define and figure out what Bitcoin actually is and what kind of, what is the constant in Bitcoin? Because it's not easy to say, you know, like every line of the Bitcoin code changed already. And it's still backward compatible with the original code that Satoshi put out. But it's it's like the, the ship of thesis where you replace one plank after the other. And at the end, you have you you have a different ship because everything was replaced, but it's, it is still seen as the same ship. And Bitcoin is like that. And it's it's also unchangeable in the sense that changing Bitcoin's core consensus rules is really hard. A lot of people tried and we fought a civil war over it. And so far, nobody has changed it in any meaningful way. So the first chapter is about that we have this, this immutable core and it also builds this immutable structure. So, so what comes out of Bitcoin is <laughs> truly immutable. It's thermodynamically secured and immutable. The more immutable, the, the further down uh, you go in, in the blocks. And the system itself is it, it changes a lot, even though it has this immutable soul as well. And I tried to um, describe all that in, in the couple of paragraphs in the first chapter. Yeah. Uh, you know, technology can make, the, you know, things that are scarce abundant. That, that's kind of like the framework we've really come into the 21st century with. And, you know, how does Bitcoin teach you about real scarcity? Yeah, again, it's, it's kind of this magical substance that the harder you dig for it the harder it is to find and we never mm. had anything like that like true scarcity doesn't really exist if you look into the economics of it like uh, things are economically scarce things are really hard to produce uh, mm. gold is like that as well you know like it it finds a balance where it's just not profitable anymore to dig for gold harder because you will you will be digging at a loss and this is this is true for for every resource you know like um there is no real scarcity if you look into it like we we could we could snap with our fingers and produce twice as much gold tomorrow we just have to you know we, we have to, to to dig below the sea and maybe we want to mine asteroids like there's a there's a lot of gold to go around but it's just not profitable to to find it and Bitcoin, especially in that way, like that's that's like the, the magic sauce of Bitcoin is the difficulty adjustment. It's the, the main innovation. Like it's the, the one genius idea that makes this whole thing a working and living system. And uh, once the difficulty, like once once Bitcoin had some value, the economic incentives, this feedback loop kicked in uh, that bootstrapped Bitcoin into existence. And, and that's that's still where we are. You know, like it's um, <laughs> that the harder you dig for it, the harder it gets. To find and the more secure the network gets and the more people will value it because of the kind of security guarantees that bitcoin provides and um it like all this this whole dance that bitcoin sets up is what produces this absolute scarcity and it's it's really hard to understand at first how, how this all works together and why can't you change the 21 million hard cap mm -hmm. because after all it's just code why don't you change it in the code and then it will be different well yeah that's not exactly how it works and mm -hmm. um again like in the physical world i don't think you you can have something like perfect scarcity in in the physical world even if you have like even if you have um an art mm -hmm. piece that is unique if you if you build super sophisticated technology that scans it molecule by molecule and reassembles it in a different room. Like if you have Star, Star Trek style teleportation and you just keep the original, it's theoretically possible, you know? But it's, I mean, it's, <laughs> you, you get into weird territory because you could also argue it's theoretically possible to uh, change the supply cap of Bitcoin. But still, to, to define something that is absolutely scarce, I think it only works in the digital realm. Um, you you can only like build something that is resistant to change and very similar. Like another good example of this is um, error correction. You cannot you cannot have perfect copies 
um, like in the physical realm, things degrade. That's a, that's a real problem, you know. Like your physical forces and just arrangements of atoms, they 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 will arrange themselves differently over long periods of time. And in the digital space, in the informational realm, you don't have this problem because you can have perfect error correction. If you copy something, you you can make absolutely sure that it's the same as it was before. And I think uh, a similar effect can be achieved um, for scarcity. And we see that in Bitcoin. I mean, it's not only theoretical, it's, it, it is working and it exists. And this is why we have the 21 million hard cap and nobody can argue with it and it can't be changed. And this is very, very different than everything we had before. So um, again, the in, in my opinion, the difficulty adjustment is the, the magic sauce and the most underappreciated thing in Bitcoin, especially for newcomers that haven't studied it deeply yet. Yeah, and uh, I think we'll definitely get to the difficulty adjustment as we move into the more the tech pieces. You know, it's very interesting with the scarcity, even the 21 million. I mean, you can make the argument that the 21 million number is irrelevant. Whatever number we had landed on would be the scarce number, would be the fixed yeah. uh, figure in the universe. And, you know, Seferino Moose makes the argument that only two things are genuinely scarce, time and Bitcoin. In, in that light, is our attention span a form of money? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's also why you say you pay attention, you know, like mm. you, you, you definitely have, like, I think, <laughs> I think humanity is really smart in that regard that um, we kind of, as users of language, we kind of um, forget how deeply embedded some things are in the language that we use. And that's exactly something like you hit the nail on the head. It's attention is some sort of currency as well, because you always pay the opportunity cost. You can only do one thing at once and you you sacrifice everything else. Like you, 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 you pay the opportunity cost, of course. And um, this is true for, for other things as well. I think, um, for example, when researching 21 Lessons and also the book I'm currently writing, I, I keep stumbling over the fact that you can't really figure out when money first arrived at the scene because the first mm -hmm. writings and the first records we have of humanity they are already about money you know it's already records of like who owes how many bushels of wheat to someone else <laughs> and uh it's it's also funny how we say that we we coin words and we coin terms and we coin phrases and stuff like that and i think speech itself is inherently linked to value as well because once it's in the bible too you know like things only become real and valuable once you give them a name and if, you, if it's not even worth to talk about it, and again, you know, like it's wor worth to talk about something, like you, you, you already have the value embedded in the speech. <laughs> and so, so all of that is kind of connected. And of course, that's super interesting for me because I see Bitcoin also as a form of speech. Like it's all of it is speech. The code is just words. The transactions are just speech. Blocks are just plain text. Everything in Bitcoin is plain text. And all of that is just on a philosophical and from an ontological perspective, very, very interesting to me. Yeah. And it's really interesting to me how the scarcity interplays with replication and locality. You know, transactions are broadcasted, blocks are propagated, distributed ledger as well, you guessed it, distributed. All, these is, all of these are just fancy words for copying. Heck, Bitcoin even copies itself onto as many computers as it can by incentivizing individuals to run full nodes and mine new blocks. Those are your words, not mine. Um, you know, so, you know, we have this problem where, you know, we're distributing everything, we're replicating everything, but yet it's scarce. Can you talk about the paradox of that? Yeah, I think it's an uh, often misunderstood and underappreciated fact of Bitcoin. And I, I try to talk about it often, but a lot of people throw these words around that uh, they, they will say that uh, we have digital scarcity and uh, it is digitally scarce and, and so on. And while this is kind of true, and I don't, I don't mean to be nitpicky about it, but everyone has to realize that um, that you can copy every part of Bitcoin. Like there is nothing, there is no information, no piece of information that can't be copied. And that's just in the nature of information. If you can read information, you can also copy it. That's just the nature of information. That's also why DRM never works. You can, you know, you, you can pirate 
any kind of software you can pirate any kind of movie like it, if you if you can read it if you can make sense of it you can also copy it that's just how information works and bitcoin is no different bitcoin is just information what bitcoin does is it it sets up this framework it's uh, i often describe it as this intricate dance of uh, of nodes and uh, that that builds up a system where invalid copies become meaningless. So you can copy it, you can copy parts of it, you can copy every part of it, like you can also copy your private keys and you, you, you can co copy all of it, but it will, in the end, the system will produce one thing, one set of truth, and this set of truth will only have valid transactions in it. And so this is where this digital scarcity comes from. And um, yeah, that's what I tried to describe in this chapter as well. Yeah, I like the link you made there between digital scarcity and truth. And when I think of truth, it kind of you know takes me to narratives. And you know, how did Bitcoin teach you that narratives are important? Yeah, um, that's a that's kind of a deep question because since Bitcoin is this radically decentralized system, the whole idea is that nobody can tell you what Bitcoin is. That's just by definition. You yourself, you run your own node, you make your own rules. And um, if you're lucky, your definition of Bitcoin is in consensus and agrees with the vast majority of the network. And as long as you are in consensus, you can make use of Bitcoin's network effects. And, but what Bitcoin is and what it will be and where it goes, it's, it's kind of a, a question of narratives, of, of how you see it and, and also your idea of what is important. So narratives are crucial in bitcoin like again we saw that in the in the block size debate which was a war about narratives and it it was actually a battle a battle about the soul of bitcoin and about the process of changing this soul when needed you know like it was it was basically is do we do we want to adjust the soul of bitcoin to fit this narrative even if we even if we risk breaking backward compatibility. And all of these kind of questions, I'm afraid they will come up over and over again. Um, I mean, I also think that the protocol will ossify over the long run. And uh, I think we are at a point now where hard forks won't be um, even real realistic unless it means the death of the protocol. But still, it's kind of, you know, what Bitcoin is, since there is no central authority to dictate what Bitcoin is, you have to decide for yourself what Bitcoin is. And by participating with a full node, you actually have a say in, in this question. You, you have to define it for yourself. And um, that's just how Bitcoin operates. It, it operates on, on this idea that you make your own truth. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned before, Bitcoin is information. Information is speech. And my question there is, do you think we have freedom of speech right now? It's a tricky question because I think it's also a very US centric question <laughs> because not many countries, not many countries wow. have freedom of speech in the first place. Right. Um, like uh, I'm from Austria and we definitely don't have freedom of speech. Uh, we have laws in place where you can't say certain fra phrases just because of the history of Nazi Germany. And um, we have actually laws in place where you can't say certain things and can't do certain things. But um, it's even more complicated than that because also in the US, for example, you, you just can't say anything, you know, like you always have some kind of limits. You can't scream fire in a crowded theater for example you know like that's the go-to example and um in in terms of it's like <laughs> it's even <laughs> even even from the moving away from the legal definitions of of all that i think it's super difficult to answer this question because most speech now happens online and it happens not in uh, public fora, but in something that approximates public forums, which are, yeah, it's of course Twitter and Facebook and Google and uh, everything else, you know, like uh, all other <laughs> public forums are probably hosted on AWS. And those are the powers now that have a say in what is okay to be said and what isn't. And I think, I think 
in the US, freedom of speech is still very alive. I think um, even though even though it is difficult currently to talk about that and there is a lot of censorship and other things going on, I think um, when you compare it to truly totalitarian regimes, mm. um, it is still a world of difference. So uh, you won't get executed if you say the wrong thing. You might get deplatformed nowadays, but you can still, you know, like uh, voice your opinions and you can still criticize the president and so on and so yeah. forth. So yeah, I, I don't think I can answer that in a yes or no question. I think in general, if you have, like, <laughs> I think um, freedom of speech is absolutely paramount for a free society. I think there is no other way to correct course. You, you only have speech or you have violence. And those two things are not equal. Like you, <laughs> even even if some people <laughs> want to equate them currently. But um, I see no other way for a society to progress um, except for this course. You, you need to be able to talk about things and you need to be able to <coughs> also risk being wrong, you know, like you risk to say the wrong thing and just hash it, hash it out in conversation. I think it's the only way. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously I'm an American, so it was, it was definitely a US, U.S. centric question. You know, I do feel that I have, you know, freedom of speech here uh, in most regards. I do feel that, you know, I might even self-censor myself at times. And I don't know if that's always a bad thing. You know, there's some things I want to say, maybe I need to think about that, you know, and I'm not even saying it's a controversial or anything. It's just not everything needs to be shared. Um, but I feel that we're moving more towards that um, global panacticon where um, speech is getting more and more regulated, I feel. But over the long arc of time, do you think we're going to have more freedom of speech in 50 years or less? I think more because I think everything else is just unstable. I think mm -hmm. I think our theory, uh, um, like the more restrictive a regime is or a system is, the more um, you try to control an organic system top down, uh, the less stable it is. I think the only way to find a stable equilibrium is without the use of any force. Mm. And uh, this implies letting people speak freely because you actually need to apply force to silence people. And this is true in natural systems. And I think since humans and societies and, and all the rest of it, uh, even the internet, you know, and Bitcoin for that matter, uh, they are natural systems. I think over the long run, 50 years, it will kind of work itself out. At least I hope so. But uh, I think I think there's something to be said for this, um, for, for a natural equilibrium that doesn't need any additional force to sustain itself. Right. You know, it's, uh, getting into Bitcoin is a humbling experience. Um, you know, as Jameson Lopp tweeted, no one has, has found the bottom of the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Let's say that, you know, well, one, I'm curious, like, how do you choose what information to consume right now, regardless of it's Bitcoin or not? How do you choose? So currently, if the person has laser eyes, the chances are good that <laughs> the content will be good. <laughs> but yeah, the, all, all kidding aside, it's it's really hard to filter through the noise um i think it takes it takes like it takes some some skill and i'm not sure if you like i think if you're a digital native it will be very easy for you to to kind of find information and also figure out um who is full of shit and who isn't i think if you if you're if you grew up on the internet you you are way ahead of the curve when you compare yourself to someone who um got all his information from uh, from the library system and uh it just is used to the old ways of doing things i would say um like the, um, <laughs> I, I i have a hunch that this is true and i think i also have some data to to back this up because um the the young guns that came in in the last couple of years um you know like the the 20 somethings um, they got up to speed really quickly in the Bitcoin space. And those are the people that I'm, I'm thinking about. Like they, they're not only digital natives, they're pretty much Bitcoin natives for, for the, the most part as well. And they were really good at uh, figuring out um, who is to be trusted, even though that's a weird thing to say in, in the Bitcoin world. But still, you kind of need to find out who is trying to educate and who is trying to tell the truth about these kind of systems and who is trying to just 
um, yeah, scam you and sell you their, <laughs> their own shitcoin. Right. That's that's the. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things to figure out uh, when you first come into the Bitcoin space. Yeah, let's say Bitcoin was never invented. What do you think would be consuming your mind share right now? Um, hmm. That's a good question. I did I did all kinds of things um, before I got into Bitcoin, but I think one of the things that I was most interested in and um, that I hope I <laughs> I hope I would be working on that. <laughs> like hypothetically, if Bitcoin was never invented and I uh, yeah <laughs> I had to do something else, um, I would love to just work on free and open source software and it doesn't really matter what it is uh, i think you know like the more ambitious the project the better um uh, like something like uh, for example the linux kernel or uh, git the versioning system itself working on something like that would be really cool but um yeah i was very interested in the idea of free so software and how it is just a superior system in the long run and um, that would be something that I would be working on, I think. Yeah. Well, let's change it up a little bit. What if Bitcoin is a fiat complete? It's completely successful, adopted mainstream. It's 30 years from now. What do you think you'd be interested in then? It's funny that you say it's 30 years from now, because um, not too long ago, a lot of people said, you know, like it, it will take 50 years, it will take 100 years, it will take 150 years. And now it seems that 30 years is the conservative estimate. Oh, I think that's a conservative. Yeah, I think it's going to take shorter than that. But, um, you know, let's be well, conservative. Complete Bitcoin adoption, hyper Bitcoinization has already happened. Um, so, so the question was what I would be working on or... Yeah, I mean, like, where would your mind noodle to if you didn't have this major, let's call it obstacle, a problem that's being solved at the moment, but it's being worked on to be solved. It's not done. Um, but let's say that that was a relief. It's in the rear view window. We have sound money. You know, um, would it be back to open source software building uh, layer two, three, four technology? Or would you be painting, you know, the, the, the night stars you know, in the backyard. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of both. I, I really like photography. I've I've been taking pictures for, yeah, probably 20 years now almost. And um, so I'd like to do that more, but, you know, there are only 144 blocks in a day. So mm -hmm. <laughs> time is scarce, as we already discussed. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I really hope that, I really hope that, I really hope that moving back to a sound monetary standard will free up people in general to do more of what they like and more of what they're good at and remove the need for um, staying in the hamster wheel and doing just, um, yeah, stupid jobs that <laughs> eat your soul and <laughs> nobody wants to do in the first place. I, I think it will also remove a lot of um, excess waste and a lot of the bullshit jobs that we see. Like uh, I personally know so many people that um, like they know that their jobs are kind of bullshit, you know, like uh, working in, I don't know. I, I, I'm just, I'm just coming up with examples now, you know, but just working at, at very large banks, for example, and just shuffling papers or uh, working at very large insurance firms and just, you know, you're done with your work. You, you, you punch in the clock at 9 a.m. and you're done at like 9.30 and you won't get any more work in for the rest of the day. So all the people are doing is just, uh, you know, the internet, of course, um, is blocked because, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> surfing the web is illegal. So they're on their phones or just reading books on the toilet or something like that yeah. all day long. And um, I think a sound monetary standard will remove a lot of this, these kind of um, weird excesses that we see in in the in the sick system that that fiat money helped build up probably not all of it but i i truly think if we compare it historically to um how the world operated on a sound monetary standard i think um just in general you need to be more careful with your resources and you need to you need to have a longer time horizon and just do this kind of multi-generational long-term thinking and i think um uh, it, it will be good for for many people for for myself you know i i have i still have many interests i i mean a lot of people that follow me think i i do only bitcoin all day every day and it's kind of true but i still have 
I still have the interests um, from my previous life and I do a lot of sports. Uh, I really like climbing. I used to skateboard a lot. Um, I, I, I come from a surfing family actually. So I, you know, I, I wouldn't mind moving somewhere where a beach is and just get into surfing a little bit and uh, just get into climbing more again and um, snap some pictures, read some books, write a little bit, maybe write some fiction as well. So I think those are the kind of things that I would do if, Bitcoin is completely successful and uh, I don't want to write software anymore. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree that Bitcoin and sound money will eradicate zombie companies and, and zombie jobs. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't think it will eliminate, you know, jobs people don't necessarily want to do because I think there will always be people who have money. And at that point, it will be Bitcoin and they won't want to do those things and they'll pay people yeah, to do the things they don't want to do. But I, I do agree very strongly with that. There's a lot of the of corporate American in particular that... You know, because of the easy access to fiat money and, and the static structure of the systems, that things are outdated. Uh, they didn't tech up a lot of the back office. And there are a lot of jobs that are just politically captured by, um, you know, the idea of keeping everyone on payroll. And, and a lot of those people, I wouldn't say everyone doesn't have a lot to do every day. Uh, there are definitely people who are working still nine hours a day at a job they don't like. Uh, maybe doing still paper shuffling that just has to get done. Uh, you know, there's a lot of paper shuffling that, that has to get done that no one even looks at, but everyone has to kind of check the box that it's been done. And, and that's in the, in the guise of maybe risk management and audit and documentation. Uh, I, I don't think we want to go down that rabbit hole too much, though. But, you know, um, earlier in the book, and you've actually had this in another article of yours, and Robert Breedlove has had this quote. So I'm going to read this Ralph Merkel quote that has really stuck with me. Um, briefly and non-technically, Bitcoin is the first example of a new form of life. It lives and breathes on the internet. It lives because it can pay people to keep it alive. It lives because it performs a useful service that people will pay it to perform. It lives because anyone anywhere can run a copy of its code. It lives because all the running copies are constantly talking to each other. It lives because if any one copy is corrupted, it is discarded quickly and without any fuss or must. It lives because it is radically transparent. Anyone can see its code and see what exactly what it does. Ralph Merkel, do you believe that Bitcoin is alive? Yeah, I wrote an article about that that is called Proof of Life. And interestingly, uh, Ralph Merkel was very early, like it was quite a while ago when he had this idea. He, he wrote this in uh, like early 2016. And um, it's it's a very interesting way to look at Bitcoin and it kind of, flips everything on its head you know uh, kind of like there's also this idea that um of the technosphere that technology is its own thing and it uses people to to further itself and you can have the same view uh, about all kinds of constructs you know also of cities and also of organizations and and uh, mm. uh, it's because it's 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 also in in just in general in biological systems it's very difficult to describe what a bee is doing without talking about the beehive and it's very very different to describe what an what an ant is doing um without talking about the ant colony you know like it's it's <laughs> the question arises what is more real you know is the single ant more real than the ant colony or is the ant colony actually the system that counts and the ant is completely replaceable and the same is true for bitcoin you know what is more real are the individual nodes and the people that run it more real or is bitcoin the organism like the, the superstructure more real and uh ralph merkel as far as i know was the first one that pointed it out and of course you can you can describe it as a living cybernetic organism and i think it i think it is true and the, the tricky thing with the question of uh, you asking me do you think bitcoin is alive is how do you define life and in the article that I wrote, um, I, I go through that and the, you, you have to kind of arrive at the conclusion that Bitcoin is alive because it checks all the boxes, you know, like a, a living thing needs to have growth. It needs to have reproduction. It needs to have, it needs to in, inherit traits. So it needs to have heredity. Um, it needs to have a metabolism. It needs to have a, 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 an inner structure that is stable. So it needs to have homeostasis. Uh, 
a living thing is usually cellular in nature and it needs to respond to its environment, you know? And Bitcoin does all those kind of things. Like it grows in terms of the network, in terms of market size, in terms of users. It reproduces itself, like it reproduces its, its software, it reproduces the ledger, it reproduces even, um, like it has this heredity in terms of forks that we saw. And uh, you even have horizontal and vertical chain transfer, like it can absorb features from other projects. And it also inherits its own features, of course. It has homeostasis and it uses energy to keep itself alive, like to, to keep its inner stable structure, it, it has to consume energy. And that's what proof of work does. And it, yeah, it, it has this kind of metabolism with mining. Uh, so, so again, you know, like it, <laughs> it, it, it breathes in <laughs> electricity and it exhales blocks if you will and it is of course cellular by nature uh, all kinds of parts of bitcoin are, are cellular but uh, most importantly you know it is a network of nodes and every node can be seen as a cell and it also responds to to its environment it, it responds to uh, like it, as far as i see it, it lives in in three different environments it lives in in cyberspace in meat space and in fin space and FinSpace is just a word I made up for markets. <laughs> and it responds to, to all these, you know, if something happens in the markets, the, the Bitcoin price will respond. If something happens in meat space, like if half of the planet gets nuked to orbit, Bitcoin will respond. And if something happens in cyberspace, like if there is a cryptographic breakthrough or um, like the Tor network goes down or something like that, Bitcoin will respond as well. So again, it checks all the boxes. And uh, in the article, I simply conclude that yeah, life is a process, and and Bitcoin by the by the biological like the, the definition of biologists and virologists, Bitcoin is a life. And uh, in the article, I re I really I really like the quote by Christopher McKay who said that life is like fire, not water. It is a process, not a pure substance. The simplest but not the only proof of life is to find something that is alive. And uh, I think yeah viewed through that lens, you can only conclude that Bitcoin is life. And that's how I see it as well. Yeah. It, well, the, the line that struck with me is it lives because it can pay people to keep it alive. And, and the, the way it pays people is with its own native currency. Mm -hmm. It really just blew my mind. Um, you know, Ralph Merkel, he's such a luminary. Has he spoken on Bitcoin since 2016? Um, if I'm not mistaken, he even launched his own shitcoin. So mm. <laughs> he's still he's still active mm -hmm. in the space as far wow, as wow. Because I, I, I just <laughs> blown away that I haven't heard more from him. Do you do you think that Bitcoin is an alien technology? No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't say that. Um, I mean, there are some funny conspiracy theories. Um, you know, like uh, as you said, it's alien technology, or it was invented by some time traveler, or uh, what have you. Uh, I mean, they are they are really fun to talk about, and um, I think a lot of great science fiction books could be written about this. But I think if you study Bitcoin's history, especially the writings of Satoshi himself and just its prehistory, it's very obvious that Bitcoin is a human creation. And uh, it's it's also, you know, Satoshi was very fallible as well. Like you, mm. the, the were, there were a lot of, like in... In the, in the things that he wrote about, he, not all the assumptions he made were correct. Not all the predictions he made were correct. Not all the design decisions he made were correct. But it, it doesn't matter because um, it's, you know, like Bitcoin, ever since Satoshi left, very quickly after it, it grew to something that um, is its own thing. And it is right. removed from the creator. And that I think that was also the idea. You know, I mean, there is a reason why Satoshi didn't stick around. There's a reason why he stayed anonymous. There's a reason why he removed himself from the project. There's a reason why his coins never moved. And he he disappeared really quickly. Like he wasn't even around for the first halving, you know? Like wow. he didn't even make sure to to see if the, one of the most important things that he built into Bitcoin actually works, you know, like he, <laughs> he was just making sure that it, it gets out of the gate and then he removed himself. And um, so I think the origins of, of Bitcoin are, are very human, but I also enjoy the, the views of some other thinkers uh, like Max Kaiser said this a, a bunch of times and, and some other quote unquote Bitcoin philosophers. Um, they discussed the question if Bitcoin was invented or discovered and a lot of people think that bitcoin is more of a like digital scarcity absolute digital scarcity is more of a discovery than an invention and uh yeah some some people they they go really cosmic and um 
see the hand of God in Bitcoin's creation as well. So I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily ascribe to that, but I still want to see the Bitcoin religion become a reality just for tax reasons alone. So that would be super great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, there are some interesting thoughts uh, around yeah. these kind of topics. I don't really get you know cosmic because my brain just can't really comprehend it. It's interesting that you say Satoshi is fallible. Um, you know, uh, Jimmy Song also, you know, kind of brought a lot of levity when we talked about Satoshi and he said the greatest thing Satoshi did was disappear. I have a hard time thinking of Satoshi as less than the greatest inventor or discoverer of all time, just because I can't wrap my head around certain things. A, the, the ability to launch this anonymously and leave anonymously. Um, I know privacy is really important to you. Do you think something like that can be achieved again? Uh, and not with money, maybe an invention, mm. an anonymous invention yeah, of any kind. I, I think so. I think so. And I, I even think we saw that. Um, I think the, I think the, the Mimble Wimble white paper was dropped in a similar fashion. Uh, some anonymous cryptographer dropped into IRC, I think, and just dropped the paper and disappeared again. And nobody, still nobody knows, I think, mm. who it was. So it, it's definitely possible. It's it's way more like. But you have to differentiate between between maybe inventing something and just showing something off that you did in an anonymous way mm. or and bootstrapping a global network um, because that's like, as Robert Breedlove points out, Bitcoin is this path-dependent invention or this path-dependent phenomenon because now everyone is kind of interested in those kind of things. And you can't, you know, like Bitcoin had probably until I would say maybe like 2015 or so um, where it was on the ground, where it was, you know, that so few people were interested. In it. I, I mean, of course, you know, the first, uh, maybe you know that the, the, the first Slashdot article, I think it was 2013 or something like that. The first time it, it really got, well, it, it was maybe 2013 or maybe even 12, I don't know. But at, at least the first couple of years, you know, like um, Bitcoin was, completely underground and we just don't have this kind of situation anymore where any kind of decentralized project will attract a lot of attention now it doesn't matter what it does yeah. because everyone is kind of interested in it and of course everyone would love to time travel back to 2010 and just buy all the bitcoin they can and that's that's why any kind of fair launch i think is impossible now because that's what people try to do when they launch a competition and i think what what you have to realize as well is all these kind of decentralized systems, they always suffered an incentive problem. And the way to deal with the incentive problem is with money. You pay people to run the nodes. And so everything suffered an incentive problem. Torrents, all of it, you know, the internet archive, it doesn't matter what you pick. It's always an incentive problem. You always, it's the tragedy of the commons, you know, like open source software suffered the same kind of incentive problem. Who is willing to do all of this for free who is willing to to offer all the music of the world and all the movies and all the tv shows for free and who is who is going to keep an archive of the internet for free who is going to work on open source software for free and so i think these kind of systems will always need some kind of monetary incentives for them to truly work and bitcoin was the first thing and now we have money in cyberspace and we can use bitcoin to bootstrap other decentralized networks that's how i see it Right. It's interesting you bring up monetary incentives. And, and that's another thing I just can't get over with Satoshi is, you know, uh, you know, he creates this new money or discovers this new money. And the incentive is to reap the reward, you would think. That's usually the normal incentive. And, and this person, it's interesting how you, you choose, you said it, you, you, you choose to refer to Satoshi as a Japanese male because that's how Satoshi identified uh, himself in his writings. Mm -hmm. And so you just you, you choose to identify that way out of respect for his own choice. So I'll go on that line. So it's just amazing to me that this person can, you know, uh, what age is this person? Because there's an enormous amount of interdisciplinary knowledge that is needed. Uh, and I think wisdom and, and life learning. Uh, I'm assuming this person had money from before Bitcoin. And then I can't get over the disappearance in terms of just the patience to watch this thing grow that you've discovered or created and not, uh, maybe this person's anonymously, um, chiming into the conversation or maybe this person's not alive but uh, the point is that we don't hear from the satoshi himself uh comment on the activity i mean it's just it's mind-boggling i you know it, if this person is married have they told their spouse <laughs> you know what i mean like 
how do you how do you manage this sort of secret? Uh, I mean, I, I can't. I don't even think Banksy is truly anonymous. There's probably ten to twenty people at least who know who Banksy is. And if Banksy's not a person mm-hmm. or a group, you know, mm-hmm. and someone someone's paying him some uh, through the old system. You know, it's just phenomenal to me. I, I, I can't get over it. It seems superhuman. Yeah, it seems like it, and it's. It's such a fascinating story because Satoshi definitely was a genius. Like he he got so many things so right, and as you say, he his his like his breadth and depth of knowledge is insane. Like he he the, the, all the important things he got right. right, and it's I think that's I think a lot of people can't get over this. I think Satoshi was one person, and uh, I think just. Because of his genius, a lot of people think that it was a group of people. But uh, you, you mentioned did he tell his wife and stuff like that. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> I agree with you that he, he kind of, it, it took a lot of time to think about these problems and build actually build Bitcoin. And he wrote about that. Like he, he was, you know, um, thinking about that for like two and a half years. Uh, how, what kind of, what kind of um, transaction constructs have to be included because he knew that the, basic layout of the system was set in stone forever so he had to get it right at the first try and like he he knew all of those things and i think you can't build bitcoin on the side i I think as well like he was (laughs) he he had a good exit or something and uh, was just able to to work on his pet project for a couple of years and i think like he he obviously worked on similar things before like you don't just just uh, just because you're bored on a, on a saturday uh, you don't learn all this computer science and cryptography and and monetary history and all of it i mean the there were a bunch of people that tried to do similar things and they had similar skill sets and they uh, I, I think if you if you actually want to find satoshi you would have to look at these kind of people and um I think it would make sense that Satoshi was a similar kind of guy, like, you know, having a very strong background in cryptography, um, knowing what money is, knowing how distributed systems work, um, knowing how to apply this knowledge in terms of actually being able to write code and stuff like that. And so I don't think he told anyone really, because I'm a huge, (laughs) like, I'm a huge believer that, three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead, you know, <laughs> you know, this saying it's just, <laughs> if the more people know the, <laughs> the, the likelihood that something gets out just grows exponentially. And yeah, I, 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 but I, I also want to say that in the end, it doesn't really matter who Satoshi was and who he is, or if he's still alive, it's, it's very similar to, other geniuses that enrich the world with their ideas and just very similar to how it doesn't matter who Pythagoras was, you know, like Mm. we we have the Pythagorean theorem and you can prove it to yourself that it works and you can prove it to yourself that what this guy was saying is actually true. And with Bitcoin, it's the same thing. You can prove it to yourself that it works. You can like the market proves it for you that it is valuable and it works. And if you want to dig really deep into it, you can start from first principles and prove everything for yourself, the cryptography, the mathematics behind it. You can go through the game theoretical aspects. You can sketch out the whole system for yourself and truly understand how it works. And you don't need to know who Satoshi was or if it was a person or if it was a group or if it was a man or a woman or what have you. I think it's not that important. I agree in the, in the grand scheme of things. It, it's where my, my little, you know, small brain gets uh, caught up is, you know, I think when we were all little, we all, I shouldn't say we all, but a lot of people I think dream about being Einstein, Newton, Pythagorean. I mean, I'd love to have the Jungleman theorem. Everyone thinks that, you know, not everyone, but I think a lot of people dream about, you know, accomplishing great things in life. And, and some people I think dream about that because they want to enjoy the benefits that come from that. And some people actually enjoy the work that they're doing and then they are passionate and they hope that their work connects and, and is meaningful. And, and I think most people, when they dream about connecting, they dream about that probably recognition, you know, look, look at me, look what I did. And I think it's really hard for my monkey brain to, to wrap my head around that this person was just, I don't know what trade it was, but to walk away and just watch. 
you know, and yeah. sit back. I mean, I would feel like my tongue, my tongue was cut off. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think that's the reason why a lot of people think that he is actually dead, because mm-hmm. it truly requires superhuman humility to stay in the shadows. Like if Samo- Satoshi is still alive and has access to his keys, then <laughs> uh, like he, he truly is the, the most humble <laughs> person that ever lived. <laughs> yeah, I think if he's a, yeah, sorry. I <laughs> no, no, no worries. I, I just was about to say that it would be really funny if the original coins moved, like all hell would break loose. <laughs> right. I, I think that if he is alive, then he's, he's destroyed the keys to prevent himself from, from dealing with that uh, problem or that dilemma. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So this person creates a new monetary system. And, you know, earlier in the show, we talked a lot about, or not a lot, but we talked a little bit about inflation, how I would attack that problem and surveillance and micropayments. But, you know, we didn't really frame it up as a new monetary system. Uh, do you ever come across trying to explain Bitcoin to people as a new monetary system and not just money? Hmm, that's a, that's a difficult question. I, I explained Bitcoin so many times to so many different people. And I truly think that you have to, like, there is no elevator pitch for Bitcoin because it depends on right. where the person is coming from. And some people know a thing or two about money or monetary history. or Like, I, I talked to some older people that, that still know what what happened like in the world war ii era and what happened in weimar germany and they they know the importance of good money you know like they they don't necessarily understand all the nuances and properties of good Mm -hmm. money and don't know all the theories but they have uh, they themselves or their parents have experienced what brutal hyperinflation looks like and how how it looks like uh, if the money fails and so it's really easy to talk to those people um about bitcoin as a hard money and as a monetary system that uses hard money and i think i think the the monetary system aspect of it is it's kind of easy to explain also to people that fought a lot with the traditional banking system (laughs) so people that just you know like it, it doesn't even have to be because you you have a job that your government doesn't like. But of course, you know, the go-to example is um, uh, people that legally sell marijuana or people um, that work in the sex industry also legally. And they just have the most terrible time to use the existing monetary systems. Right, like right. they can't they can't even open a bank account. They're, they're just locked out. And uh, this is, but this is also true for people that need to do cross-border payments or just work somewhere else. Uh, in in Europe, you know, like Europe is like every single country is kind of small, and so it happens a lot that people just work somewhere else or have family somewhere else. And if you want to um, send money back and forth, or if you if you come for from from uh, yeah <laughs> from somewhere else, it's sometimes really hard to just open a bank bank account and and just do all that without without insane delays, without paying insane fees. And I think it's really easy to, to pitch Bitcoin as this new modern um, digitally native monetary system to those kinds of people. Yeah, it's enormously difficult. Uh, you know, I think when you, when you come at it with just sort of the sound money, it, it leads to a lot of questions. They, they question Bitcoin, they don't question the dollar, but it makes, I'm not saying what makes them think, but like, you might just end up at the level where like, hey, maybe we just need to uh, fix the US dollar or maybe if the Japan just stopped printing the yen, we'd be all good. It doesn't really explain the breadth of, of Bitcoin. And it's so hard to bridge that gap. Like you're saying, there's no elevator pitch. And I, I get to the end of my elevator pitch and, and fumes started to come out of the back of my head uh, <laughs> w- when they're just not grasping what I'm trying to get across, you know? Um, yeah, it's re- it's really hard. I think every single Bitcoiner went through this experience many times. You just want to, you 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 want to help other people to see what you are seeing. You want to make them understand, but it's it's really difficult. And I, I understood a long time ago that um, Bitcoin will be understood by you when you are ready. I think there is no other right. way. Right. And also, you know, small B Bitcoin will find you when you are ready. So you will you will start stacking your first sets or receive your first Bitcoin when you are ready to receive them. Yeah, you know, I've also uh, on the on the topic of hyper Bitcoinization, I've changed my mind. I think we've been in hyper Bitcoinization since January third, two thousand nine. Um, <laughs> you know, up we're up six hundred million percent, and 
it, it's just it's it's beyond obvious. I mean, if you just look at like you know, you used to be able to buy ten thousand Bitcoin for a dollar, and now it takes sixty thousand dollars to buy a Bitcoin. That is hyper Bitcoinization to me. Uh, we're just on that path, but I don't think we ever had hyperinflation before. Um, and, and maybe I'm. We've always had inflation, but it, to me, it wasn't hyper. I, I think we're in this hyperinflated era now. Do you think that inflation is um, more of an issue today, or the same issue? And what I mean by that is, have we always been, you know, they, they print money and they've always printed money, or has something changed since two thousand and eight, and and with MNT, or is MNT just another way of selling what we've always been doing since nineteen seventy one? Um, I think in general, if people have the power to magically make money appear, mm. they will use that kind of power. And it, I'm not saying they necessarily are doing that for nefarious reasons. You will find very good reasons to just make money appear. It's if you think this is a good reason to print money, you will find those kind of reasons. And historically, you know, it was world wars, and now currently it is a global pandemic. And of course, you know, you you, you want to help. You have a large money printer, so you're trying your best to help, and you print all the trillions um, that you can. And I I would agree that we like it might just be the beginning of a hyperinflationary period, but it's very hard to tell. You know, like gold bucks have been talking about the collapse for, I don't know, probably like 30 years now. And it's always amazing how, how much breathing room the dollar still has. You know, like people were talking about the global collapse of the financial system in 2008, of course, and uh, they were able to print their way out of it. And I'm, I, I mean... <sighs> It's, it's difficult for me to say because I also lack the necessary expertise, but it seems to me that things are indeed a little bit different now because we already see uh, prices you know, of steel and lumber and, and other things inflating by quite a bit uh, in the US, in, in US dollar terms. And to loop back to your point about being in hyper-Bitcoinization, I... Uh, I, I think it's really funny how, how the narrative around that changed because hyper-Bitcoinization itself was a crazy concept not too long ago. And people were laughing me out of the room for being hyper-hyper bullish and just like drawing those kind of exponential graphs and just telling everyone, you know, like we're 50% done in terms of hyper-Bitcoinization. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and now I'm suddenly bearish because I'm, I'm sticking uh, to my initial initial. Um, target which is still like eight and a half years away so i i think we will see a hyperinflation scenario the way i see it is we are currently living through bitcoinization and compared to fiat currencies it already feels like hyper bitcoinization because fiat currencies are devalued devaluing at a rapid pace and this thanks to to the interventions the monetary interventions because of the covid virus um it also happens to the dollar currently. I mean, you know, like expanding the monetary base by 30% is, is no joke. But of course, we, we saw if you look into, um, <laughs> if you look at Turkey or if you look at Venezuela, um, in terms it, like for Venezuela, hyper Bitcoinization is in the past pretty much. <laughs> you know, for, for the Bitcoiners living in Venezuela, hyper Bitcoinization is in the past. But what I, what I, what I think about when I think about hyper Bitcoinization, it's very similar to inflation and hyperinflation. And Hayek pointed that out as well, that, you know, mild and steady inflation does not exist. It, it can only lead to outright inflation. You know, like if you have a 1% growth, it doesn't matter what kind of, it doesn't matter what kind of percentage growth you have. If you have a constant percentage growth, you will always have an exponential function. Like even if it's 0.1% growing, you 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 will you will hit the curve of the knee one day and it it's just it's an ex exponential function any kind of exponential growth like any kind of percentage growth is an exponential function mm. so the way i see it is we are living through bitcoinization but we are still before the crazy part we are still you know like if you compare it to inflation and hyperinflation we are still in the inflationary period we haven't hit hyperinflation yet and the the way i see it with bitcoinization and hyperbitcoinization i think it will happen really quickly and i'm not sure if it will happen all at once but i think i think that 
different parts of the population will completely switch to a Bitcoin standard really quickly because their own money is useless or their financial system collapsed. And it just makes way more sense to, to move to a Bitcoin standard. And we saw that in the past where, um, where monetary systems and the money collapsed, that people just reverted to barter or just um, keeping keeping their own taps, you know, like everyone has, they, they meet they meet at the bar and everyone knows who owes what to whom and the lists are there and not at the bank. And I think now that we have Bitcoin, a system, an open system that operates worldwide and everyone can use it really cheaply, like you can use it almost for free, then it makes sense that if this happens in a country, people will flock to Bitcoin. And I think with people like Jack Mullers and other folks building out infrastructure that enables that, super easily you know like you, you download an app and you're set then once shit really hits the fan in your country switching to a bitcoin standard becomes super easy right i, I wanted to go back to cyber cypherpunks for a second it, it's interesting to me you know the notion about bitcoin is that like silicon valley the technology community in america thinks about it or technology community in the world thinks about it as tech and you know maybe other people we think about it as money but cypherpunks really understood technology and money to me so I'm kind of curious what made them special in that regard uh, and were they, rev are, were they revolutionaries and are they revolutionaries today? And I think you kind of answered my question there. With, I would say Jack Maller is a cypherpunk, but are, are there cypherpunks today? Oh, there the definitely are, you know, like <laughs> it's, it's again, it's, it's, it's hard to, to speak about these kind of groups uh, in the end, only individuals exist and just like, uh, the Bitcoin community doesn't like when you talk about something like the Bitcoin community because <laughs> you know there there's no Bitcoin community. Right, right. <laughs> there are only individuals using Bitcoin. Um, I think it's it's similar to to cypherpunks, but there are definitely some self-identified cypherpunks. Um, there there are cypherpunks that would fit the general criterion that uh, you can probably look up online. But in general, cypherpunks they. Like if you read the cypherpunk manifesto, it talks about the importance of privacy and how how a free society requires um, privacy guarantees, certain privacy guarantees. And of course, also, you know, everyone knows the saying, cypherpunks write code. So that seems to be a precondition as well, that cypherpunks are the ones that actually build the tools. Like cypherpunks realized that um, the best way to make change happen is not by political action, but by implementation. And um, so I would say we have more cypherpunks today than ever, because I think um, like, even though it's, it's, it's very hard to, um, to see, I would say, because everyone kind of knows the legends of the past and, and knows the big names. But I think there are so many people now that realize that um, getting politically active is probably not the best way forward. And since so many people, especially those living in cyberspace and and just writing code they're digital nomads anyway you know like all you need is a backpack and your laptop and uh, so why should you go through the the very hard and long and just painful process of changing the small country you're coming from if you can just pack your bags and go to some nice beach and uh, sit in a wi-fi cafe and just live your life there and build the tools in cyberspace and i i think there are many many people that do that and if you if you do it with the right ethos and for the right reasons i would label you a cypherpunk for sure right it was also interesting how you uh, earlier said you know the bitcoin standard and for me i think the bitcoin standard is more about less about buying bitcoin and stacking sats it's not about how much bitcoin you have it's about thinking in bitcoin and, and using bitcoin as your ruler uh, as the way you count mm -hmm. um i just think that's really important um it's not about how much Bitcoin you have, it's how you use it. And it's a tool. And, you know, one of the things Plato wrote in his dialogue with Thedemus that we value some things because they are rare and not merely based on their necessity for our survival. You know, how do we define value? Yeah, I think that's what the Austrian economists got right and everyone else kind of got wrong because uh, mainstream economists and Keynesian ex economists, they talk a lot about intrinsic value. And um, if you look deeply into that, there's, there just is no such a thing, you know, like if humans wouldn't exist, nothing would be valuable, <laughs> like gold would be more valuable than iron or what have you. And 
um, yeah, the, the philosophers of the past pointed it out um, very beautifully. And it's it's the paradox of, of the diamonds and the water. Like, what is more valuable? Like, if you're if you're um, <laughs> if you're dying of thirst in the desert, then you, the diamonds are just not valuable to you. You 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 need a sip of water. And so, um, yeah, we we see this. I think I think Mises points it out beautifully in his um, like <laughs> magnum opus human action that humans act based on their values and what you define as valuable you you define for yourself individually and um, so you can't really answer objectively what is valuable and what is not it's always a subjective evaluation and what might you know we kind of have this wisdom embedded in some sayings just like you know ebay figured that out <laughs> ebay figured out this like ebay is built on on the saying one man's trash is another man's treasure and you might have no use for it and you put it on ebay and someone is willing to pay 200 bucks for for your trash and and that's basically how the ebay economy used to work i i realize it's a bit different now but but that's that was the basic idea and it worked beautifully and that that just shows you very practically that this subjective theory of value is true, I would say. Right. You know, it's interesting. I, I also, I, I think we should stop calling ourselves Austrian economists and maybe just change it to smart or better economists. Uh, <laughs> I, I think by labeling ourselves, you know, we kind of make it sound weird and outlandish and, and not on the same plane as the economists, you know, who, who have yeah. been wrong for the last 50 I, years. I have to say, as, a, as an Austrian, um, I'm very comfortable with calling myself. Fair an, enough. An fair enough. Economist. You like being split out. I hear you. I, I think we should all be lumped together. We should have good and bad economists, <laughs> right and wrong, uh, <laughs> smarter and less smart. Um, how complicated is a world without money? Wow. Um, I think a world without money doesn't really work. And as we said before, like money seems to be we seem to have evolved alongside money and money in essence is something that is able to scale interaction and for any kind of large scale interaction where you as one node in the network don't have the full information of the rest of the network you need some kind of some kind of messaging system that lets you figure out organically what other people are doing and what is a valuable action to take and what isn't and for for humans it's it's basically yeah speech and money and i i think you know just from a from a network and information theoretical perspective um nothing scales if you if you look at i mean most people know about dunbar's number that mm -hmm. you can have like 150 relationships in your head and just the the combinatorial explosion of these relationships um like with, with 100 with 150 people you you already have so many relationships between all these people it's uh, like it, it grows <laughs> more than exponentially you know and so any kind of information system that works in this networked manner needs something that gets rid of this combinatorial explosion and uh, you, you have this in, in networks with connections, like in a, in, a, in a global trade system or in any kind of trade system. And it's even worse when it comes to trade because you also have this combinatorial explosion um, that's especially obvious in the barter economy because you have different kinds of goods. So, so if you think of trade as a network and every node is a different kind of good or service, it's, it's like even twice as bad as it <laughs> would be, like exponentially twice as bad as it, as it usually would be. So I would say a world without money wouldn't even work. And we also see this in biology and Brandon Quidham, um, a lot of people know him from, from the mushroom articles uh, yeah. uh, that he wrote and he compared Bitcoin again to a living organism and to this mycelial network that is used by, by mushrooms to, to communicate. He points out that even in biological networks and biological systems, we always have a kind of money, you know, like they, uh, they, they have different kinds of, um, different kinds of things that they swap and exchange for nutrients, for example. And so, so these large-scale interactions only work if you have a, a token of value to communicate what you want and what you need and what you have to offer. Mm, interesting. What is the value of privacy? And can someone reclaim privacy? 
I think again, I think you we we touched on this briefly when we talked about free speech. I think you need to have the luxury to be wrong in, with your ideas and with your speech. And I think that's why free speech is paramount. And the easiest way to be wrong is be wrong in private conversation. Like if you discuss ideas with your friends or even if you discuss ideas with yourself. And just in general, you can I, you can see how important privacy is just by looking at people that are uh, that are filmed, but they don't know that they are filmed and they might be doing silly things and be dancing or be talking to themselves. And once, once they realize that the camera is on, they become really self-conscious and change their behavior drastically. So I think, I think you cannot be truly free if you're surveilled is what I'm trying to say. So, so one, one, um, I don't remember who said this first, but it's one quote that I really like. It's surveillance renders all other freedoms useless. So if, if you are, that's that is the idea of the panopticon, basically. You know, you're you're in a prison and and you think that you're surveilled all the time, and so privacy, I think, for uh, as the cypherpunks wrote as well, you know, for a free society, privacy is absolutely essential. You need to be able to talk in private, to think in private, to act in private, and also remember that every every progress in society, like progress in a society, can only work if you are willing and able to break the law and discuss your intentions to break the law like you know women voting was against the law gay marriage was against the law taking any kind of drugs was against the law in times of prohibition um buying selling having drinking alcohol was against the law and all these kind of things that we see that we see as progress in, in a society would not be possible without privacy because if the status quo can always see and monitor what you are discussing and what you're thinking and what you want to do, no progress can ever happen. Right. I also like what you said about privacy is selecting, selectively revealing yourself or oneself. And, you know, like I've revealed myself on this podcast. And so what I'm kind of getting at is, can I return to privacy one day or, or am I missing the question here? Yeah, I think you can. I, I I think people did this as well. You know, like people people went dark, and um, it's it's funny. I, mag magicians <laughs> show you that all the time that um, that people are really bad at um, identifying other people if they change their appearance only slightly. Like if you would grow a beard and run around with a hat all the time, I think nobody would recognize you, even even if videos and pictures of yourself are <laughs> out there. And so I think you can definitely do it if you want to. Um, I think. I think in, in general, currently it's really hard to be truly private, but it always depends on your attack factor. Like if you if you're Edward Snowden and you're trying <laughs> to hide from the US government <laughs> because you just re revealed the most scandalous global surveillance system that exists, then it's really hard to stay private. Like you 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 really need to know what you're doing. You're not allowed to run around with your phone in your pocket. Um, you need to hide from all CCTV cameras uh, and so on and so forth. Like that's really difficult. But stay private online um just like satoshi did for example or like um to to pick someone who is still around like 6102 bitcoin for example on twitter um he does not appear on podcasts so he hides his voice uh, nobody as far as i know um knows how he looks like and so he's he's very careful about that and it's it's still very possible to do that um, going back from doxing yourself, I think is really hard. Uh, it's still possible if you look into resources of Jameson Lop, for example. Um, he went through this whole ordeal because he got swatted once. And um, so you kind of have to change your address, change all your phone numbers, change your name, um, take precautions, maybe change your appearance, um, maybe even you know, move to a different state or move to a different country. Um, basically do all those kind of things that... Uh, someone who uh, <laughs> is on the on the hit list of the mafia and is now in like protected by the police would go through, and it's it's possible, but it's not something anyone um, would do lightly or would want to do. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of reducing your online footprint and just if you don't have to use your real name, don't use your real name. If you don't 
want to or need to post pictures online, don't post pictures online. <laughs> if you like, don't install surveillance uh, thingies in your kitchen or in your bedroom. Like, if you can't live without an Amazon Alexa or a Google thingy or whatever, or with Siri in your bedroom, just get rid of all all this kind of stuff. There is enough surveillance as it is already. But of course, it's hard. You know, like it's it's a trade off of convenience and having a public persona or not. Yeah, I mean, I ripped out all the Alexas in my house. Uh, there was a moment where I got a couple of Alexa dots, like 30 bucks each. And I thought it'd be great, it'd be convenient. Uh, but I had the privacy issue and then compounded with my kids having Alexa set timers every five minutes uh, to go <laughs> off. And they thought that was incredibly fun, uh, made it a lot easier. <laughs> you know, and I still, I still haven't turned on Siri on my iPhone, but I, I struggle with that because I, I do like convenience. I do like technology. <laughs> In defense of your kids, that sounds yeah. really fun. It sounds oh, like a oh. fun way to annoy the parents. Yes, they had a lot of fun. Uh, and they, they do a very good job of, uh, of playing pranks on me, uh, you know, and having a good time. But um, what is Bitcoin's difficulty adjustment? We, we, you touched on it a little bit before, but like, how do we explain that? Why is it so important? Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to explain if you don't know how Bitcoin works in the first place. So uh, mm. explaining it to someone that has no idea about Bitcoin, I think it's just not the right move yeah. at first. I think you will have to confront with people. Uh, you have to confront the people just with some truth that they need to just assume is true. You know, like there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin and nobody can change that and so on. And they just have to have to swallow that <laughs> and you'll find out if you dig into these questions it, it all it all comes back to the difficulty adjustment so as i've said before the difficulty adjustment is is the mechanism behind um like it's the magic sauce that makes everything right. work and it, it allows it allows bitcoin the asset or the substance to be as scarce as needed so if you mine for it like you a, a very nice analogy would be would be to to mine for something that is like gold but it's like this magic substance and the harder you dig for it the harder the harder like the less you will find of it and <laughs> if you don't try to find it at all it will magically appear almost you know so uh, that's that's how that's in essence how the difficulty adjustment works and the the reason why it's so difficult to understand i think is because all of it is interconnected like um proof of work not only is responsible for um, minting the new bitcoins, but it, it also secures the network. So there, there are many different um, things that are super important for Bitcoin's operation, um, like all bundled up into this one kind of weird mechanism. And what Bitcoin does is it, it has this self-regulating feedback loop because of the difficulty adjustment that um, kicks in every 2016 blocks. So this is roughly every two weeks. And it just makes sure that if miners try to find new blocks, the rate at which blocks will be found is roughly every 10 minutes. So it readjusts the time it takes to find new blocks. And this is also what solves the problem that all the all the cryptographic monies ran into before Bitcoin. Like all the people that worked on Bitcoin, they tried to solve a bunch of problems. Bitcoin solved them all at once. And one of them was that you have no crypto cryptographic stability of any kind of problem. Like you cannot define a problem that is stable in computation time because computers get faster and faster and faster. We all know Moore's law and you know, like your pocket calculator is like 10 billion times faster than uh, the computer of the lunar lander was and stuff like that. So you cannot define a, a, a mathematical problem that takes this into account. It's, it's just impossible, you know, like it's, <laughs> you, you, cannot, you, cannot, you cannot have in the mathematical problem an input of the external world that asks how fast are computers currently? Because I need the solution of this problem to take at least 10 seconds. And so that's that's what the difficulty adjustment solves. It, it, it solves it in a probabilistic way, but it solves it super beautifully. And that's why I wrote in my article, um, Bitcoin is Time, which is actually a chapter of, my, of the new book I'm writing, that the difficulty adjustment is the bridge of Bitcoin time to real world human time. And yeah. it's, in, in the digital space, we don't have any sense of time. But 
Bitcoin kind of fixes this and the difficulty adjustment is what, what connects the digital realm to our physical realm and it connects it thermodynamically and probabilistically at the same time. That's why it's so ingenious. Yeah, I mean, that, that article you wrote, Bitcoin is Time, which is going to be a chapter of your next book. You know, and I mean this in the most complimentary way. It feels like a discovery to me more than an invention in the sense that like your ideas just ring true. And I'm like, how did I not see this idea in my own head? You know, because uh, going through 21 lessons, I see where you're pulling uh, your thoughts or it feels like or, or where you're teasing out the beginning of your thoughts to get to your next chapter of Bitcoin is time. I see the connection now only after you wrote it. But after you've written it, I'm like, how did I not see that? You know, <laughs> it's so true. And, you know, what's interesting about the difficulty adjustment and trying to explain that to people and, you know, how Bitcoin works, it's like, you know, people want to know how Bitcoin works before they even uh, talk to you about it or acknowledge it's a real thing or, or buy $10 worth of it. But we all, um, exaggerating here, but like I use a microwave. I don't know how it works. I couldn't take it apart and put it back together. Uh, and a car, I, I, I'm not a mechanic. I'm not very good with cars. I couldn't take one apart, especially the newer ones with the computers. And, you know, what's interesting to me is that I wonder, though, did, you know, most of the things that Satoshi uh, harnessed for Bitcoin were things that already existed. And that was very meaningful to me that this was sort of like a 300, 400 year pro project that one person pulled together all these existing resources and puzzle pieces. But the one I'm not sure about, I mean, did he kind of create the puzzle piece of difficulty adjustment or was that also something that existed that he pulled in? I think that's truly his main contribution and it's the the the, gene, the, the spark of genius again that, that makes right. it all work i mean something like the difficulty adjustment exists Probably. everywhere like right, all right. over the place like a, a simple thermostat has mm. a similar mechanism yeah, right, you know? right like it, it self-regulates because it 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 takes and it dictates the the temperature at the same time and and so that's that's how you can Think of the difficulty adjustment as well it uh satoshi's genius was in in just kind of you know like like <laughs> smashing it all together in this kind of ugly and weird and seemingly inefficient way but making it work you know and right. that's also why a lot of engineers really don't like bitcoin because at the first glance it's super inefficient because engineers like to like to maximize for efficiency and uh, like not wasting compute cycles and stuff like that. But Bitcoin optimizes for something completely different. Like it optimizes, I believe, first and foremost for decentralization and second of all for security. So it, it has like Satoshi uh, by choosing the parameters that he chose and just the way that the, the system grew as well and the, the, the backstops that were put in place, like just like the um, one megabyte block size, for example, it, it maximizes resilience. It maximizes survival. It doesn't maximize for efficiency. You know, like it doesn't maximize for, especially not for computational efficiency. And that's why a lot of computer scientists and a lot of engineers really don't like it because they, they don't understand what kind of parameters Bitcoin maximizes for. And Bitcoin doesn't care about computational efficiency, but it's super, super efficient in everything it does if you look at it uh, through the right lens and in the right way. Right. Very interesting. And I think, you know, I want to turn more towards, you know, Bitcoin is time and, and numbers. And I think this is a, you, you included this quote in your book. You, you kind of, you've even wrote an article for 21ism about Bitcoin uh, and Matrix and Morpheus and Neo. So this is a quote from Morpheus. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. And you go on to say in your words, Bitcoin is not the next shiny app on your phone. It is the foundation of a new economic reality, which is why Bitcoin should be treated as nuclear grade financial software. And when we talk about nuclear grade financial software, how do we get our head around cryptography and these unusually large numbers? I mean, just to put something in perspective, you included this fact. One trillion seconds ago, Manhattan was covered under a thick layer of ice. And that was only a trillion <laughs> seconds ago. Yeah, it's... Um, I. I... I wanted to put this in the book because um, in the news, if you read the headlines, especially in the financial 
sections but now thanks to COVID it's it's uh, <laughs> trillions are everywhere but um it sounds so similar if you talk about millions and billions and trillions but it is very very different because it is a difference of magnitude and to drive home this fact there is a, a really nice saying uh, i'm just gonna ask you to, uh, risking it I, I hope you don't know it yet but do you know what is the difference between a million and a billion a million million <laughs> no 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 a, it's it's roughly a billion that's okay that's, fair enough that's, that, that's the joke <laughs> <laughs> right 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 like fair the, the difference between a million and a billion is roughly a billion so that's what people don't intuitively grasp because the words they they just sound so similar yeah, yeah. and you don't realize that the difference is like you and know, i was wrong yeah, a million million <laughs> is a trillion not a billion so I, I was wrong there as well so but yeah i didn't even catch that but it's it's important to understand how Bitcoin works from a technical perspective if you really want to put um, your whole faith behind it, so to speak. Like if you want to put your life savings into it, I think we are still at the stage where you kind of need to understand a little bit of why it is secure, how it works. And one part of, like, I think you could argue all of its security comes from large numbers and just the impossibility of finding specific large numbers. That's how, how um, pretty much all cryptography works. And the, the way, like the reason why your private key is secure is because nobody can guess it. And the reason why proof of work is so hard to do is because nobody can guess the magic number because it's so large. And the only way how to solve the proof of work puzzle is to randomly guess insanely large numbers over and over again and that's really hard to to think about for people because they think they're not used to thinking in those very large numbers they think okay we have a computer and i just can write a small program and the computer will just go through all the numbers how long can it take you know um, a computer can probably crack like if you can crack a password in like half an hour, it can find a large number in, you know, like a couple of seconds or something like that. That's usually how, how uh, people that haven't looked into this think about those kind of things. But it turns out that even if you build the perfect computer that only uses like one atom to store a bit of information and it is thermodynamically perfect. So let's say you, you build a Dyson sphere around the sun and you can use all the energy of the sun just to power this computer. And you build this computer really large, like as large as a planet, it will still take you like until the heat death of the universe to find those kind of numbers. And that's, that's, that's just something that boggles the mind, you know, like those, the, the number spaces that we deal with in, in Bitcoin and in cryptography in general, they are so insanely large that unless we have some weird breakthrough in fundamental physics that shows that the universe works very, very differently than we assume it works. There is just no way to crack these kind of numbers, you know, like it's, it's, <laughs> and I think it was Bruce Schneier who said that, um, like brute forcing those kind of numbers is not possible unless computers are made out of something else than matter and use something else than energy or something like that. And just understanding that, uh, I think it's, it's, yeah, it, it gives, it gives Bitcoin this oomph <laughs> where, that, where you, you like, there's no comparison to anything else, you know, like if you think, if you, if you think Fort Knox is secure, for example, you, you don't understand the security of Bitcoin yet. So there, there's just no comparison. Yeah. If you think there's gold in Force Knox, I, I can sell you a bridge too. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, to, to kind of expand on what Bruce Schneier said, he, he said, if you use the physical limits of computation to put this number into perspective, even if we could build an optimal computer, which would use any provided energy to flip bits perfectly, build a Dyson sphere around our sun and let it run for a hundred billion years, we would still only have a 25% chance to find a needle in a 256-bit haystack. And his actual quote, those, these numbers have nothing to do with the technology of the devices. They are the maximums that, that thermodynamics will allow. And they strongly imply that brute force attacks against a 256-bit keys will be infeasible until computers are built from something other than matter and occupy something other than space. And I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but what, what, it, what it really alludes to is that, and, and this is the chapter in your book, is that, you know, there's strength in numbers here. 
And, and generally speaking, I like to stay away from numbers. Uh, I don't like to roll with more than three other people, my wife and two kids. Uh, I, I'm kind of, you know, a little bit on my own, but, you know, there is strength in numbers in this uh, network. And, and the numbers are just astounding. And, you know, the words we keep using here, like numbers and exponential numbers, and millions and billions and trillions, proof, work, time, you know, and telling time takes work. So, you know, and this is from your book, since the problems to be solved and proof of work are made up, many people seem to believe that it is useless work. If the focus is purely on the computation, this is an understandable conclusion. But Bitcoin isn't about computation. It is about independently agreeing on the order of things. And this is where I think we really get to the root of what Bitcoin is. And Bitcoin is time. Bitcoin is a clock. But how is timing the root problem that we're facing here in this network? Yeah. Um, so I think that's one of the most interesting things in Bitcoin and one of the most misunderstood aspects of it. Uh, what proof of work actually does, and again, it does it does many things at once, kind of. But um, the problem of timing is a really hard one because you what what you must not do in Bitcoin is reintroduce a central authority, and the clock would be a central authority as well. So you kind of have to build up your own sense of time. And um, you you said before that uh, when when you're reading my things, uh, you. <laughs> it feels like a discovery and most of the things that i write about are not my original thoughts and this in particular um like in i think it was in 2018 or something like that um so not super early on but it, it's been a couple of years uh, now um a guy named gregory trubetskoy wrote blockchain proof blockchain proof of work is a decentralized clock and that's the basis as well for this chapter in 21 lessons and it's again the basis for bitcoin is time which is a, a chapter in my new book and it, i think it will be the only kind of repeat chapter because i just after finishing 21 lessons i kept thinking about this topic how like thinking more deeply about it how it actually works and how bitcoin builds up this arrow of time and um, it's it's quite quite fascinating if you dig into the literature that Satoshi cited in the white paper that talks a lot about uh, time, the problem of timestamping and how you might build a distributed timestamp server and stuff like that. So again, all the puzzle pieces were kind of there, but we never had a working system that built up trustless time in cyberspace. And now with Bitcoin, we have that, and it's the it's the block time, like it's the block height, and what you can like you can guarantee in Bitcoin that the sequence of blocks will be one after the other. The timestamps of the blocks, they do not matter. Like the real world human timestamps, they don't matter too much. They can even be in reverse, you know, like it, it, the, a block that came previously can have a timestamp that is older than uh, the block that came after it. So the, the timestamps can be switched around, but it's only human time. It's not Bitcoin block time. And Bitcoin block time is all that counts. And it's a weird kind of clock because it is a probabilistic clock. And um, it sometimes goes in reverse even if you if you have um, chain splits, for example, which naturally can occur. Like if a valid block is found at the same time uh, by two different miners and propagates through the network equally, then a part of the network will build up on, on the first block and another part of the network might build up on the other block. And if you are on the losing side, of the chain, your clock will go in reverse briefly, you know, like it will, it will jump around. So it's, it's kind of a weird block, a, a weird clock, but it's still um, for what it does, trying to tell the time so that you can build up an absolute order in cyberspace. It works perfectly and has been working perfectly for over a decade now. And uh, again, as, as uh, Gregory pointed out in his original article, timing is actually one of the root problems. Uh, like he points out, and it is basically the root problem. And um, uh, it's you can definitely say that because the the thing that we touched upon before, the problem of cryptographic stability, which I also consider an essential problem, is again related to timing. You know, like it's the the fact that the informational realm, that cyberspace, has no sense of time, is what um, what what brings up this problem of cryptographic stability? Like you cannot tell how fast a computer in the real world will solve this problem because you cannot tell the time in, in cyberspace, not in a right. trustless manner. It's interesting. I mean, we talk about discovery. Uh, you know, Satoshi had this quote: 
The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain, which serves as proof of sequence of events witnessed. You know, it's in, I, I don't really care if you're like, re, or like kind of using thoughts that are already out there because it's the way you put it kind of got it into my brain. So for me, I don't know what I don't know. I know I discovered it when I read your work. Um, you know, but and what I mean by that is I had read that quote from Satoshi before I read your work, but I didn't think about it the way you put it forward to me. You know, and, and that's what I get. You know, I can only interact with the interface that I'm facing. Uh, so, you, you know, the work, it, it really spoke to me. And uh, I was very jealous of um, the conclusions that you were able to pull forward. Because as soon as you put them on paper, I'm like, this is so obvious. Uh, you know, and so I'm kind of curious, you know, how did Bitcoin teach you that moving slowly is one of its features and not a bug? You know, especially coming from the tech world. Yeah, for, for me, that was um, one of the most difficult lessons to learn because the, the world I come from, uh, from software development, you you have this kind of move fast and break things mentality, especially the last, I would say, 15 years. I mean, so software development used to work differently um, <laughs> before that, but ever since um, we moved to kind of this agile, highly iterative um uh, process of development it, it kind of it was also popularized by, by Facebook and other large software companies that you have to move fast and break things to go forward you know like it's very easy to correct mistakes right. in software so you might as well make them and just learn from them and, and iterate and iterate and iterate and Bitcoin is such a special system it works so differently um, as we've said before like Satoshi knew that the, the core design of the system was set in stone from day one right. and so Moving fast and breaking things is out of the question in, in the first place. It's if you if if you break it once, it's it's kind of game over. You know, like you you really must not break it because all all of the downstream effects and the guarantees that Bitcoin brings, they they are all trusting in the fact that this thing is not breaking, that it will still work, that the Bitcoin that you have are still spendable in the future, that the system that you interact with will still exist in five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 100 years from now, and so on. And like, that's the whole idea. So moving fast and breaking things just doesn't work. You know, like if, if Facebook is down for five minutes, it, it doesn't matter too much. If Google is down for five minutes, I mean, of course, you know, like those are also large systems and a lot of, of weight rests on them. Um, but I think it's, it's just a, a different situation if the value of a large part of the world is suddenly unspendable overnight. So that's why it has to be very secure, deliberate, and just also unchanging in the sense that you don't want to change the things that are working and risk that they break. Right. Yeah, I, I agree there too as well. I'm wondering though, do you think, you know, my question for you is, is time real? Is time real? <laughs> I used before I before I got into Bitcoin. I used to say um, that time is money and money is an illusion. <laughs> so maybe that answers your question. Yeah. I don't know. Time is weird. the The longer you look at it, the more elusive it gets, and it's it's such a weird concept, even like in our universe, because we don't have a fixed time in the first place. Like. Uh, of course, Einstein with his relativity showed that very clearly. And we also have like, we have some weird effects in our universe that it, it, that it seems that time is way more complicated than just this one arrow that keeps going forward. And uh, what's also funny is, uh, I'm not sure if it's funny, but it's, it's definitely interesting that all the physical laws that we discovered so far are independent of time. So there is no physical law that tells you that time exists. Um, I like to think it. Uh, I like to think of time as a kind of measure for change. If you have a system that doesn't change at all, where there is no movement at all, it's very like it, time is kind of a nonsensical concept because you you need to see change over time to have time. And if there is no change, then there probably is no time. But yeah, I don't know. Very philosophical question. I have no good answer for you. Yeah. Uh, well, I will quote you, though, um, you know, without causality, what came before and what came after is impossible to tease apart without unpredictability. Causality is meaningless. And, and the way I was kind of framing this up is like, 
you know, you could take a picture of yourself on July 21st, 2021 with a calendar that's already been pre-printed. It's yeah. predictable and I could hold it up, but that doesn't prove that it's July 21st, 2021. But if I hold up, uh, you know, a tweet like today, uh, you know, a uh, company announces that Gigi joins them. Uh, I have that that unpredictable proof that this happened and this was agreed upon by the world. And this event uh, now kind of, uh, I don't know, captures that I've already, I, I've existed beyond this event. Can you talk a little bit about like unpredictability and causality and how Bitcoin sorts through that? I use this example in, in Bitcoin in, in time to, uh, Bitcoin is time to, drive home the point that you need like to build up an arrow of time you need to have something that you can't predict because you 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 could use in the digital space to to build up a quote unquote arrow of time also the sequence of natural numbers or any other sequence that can be easily computed uh, you could use the digits of pi you could use the fibonacci sequence you could use all kinds of things it's uh, where it's obvious what came before and what came after but that's not sufficient because if you know beforehand that um, five follows four and six follows five and then it's seven eight nine uh, it's not a very useful arrow of time because you can you can you can uh, predict what's going to happen and for and now to exist it seems to me that being perfectly able to predict what happens destroys the whole concept of time and destroys the whole concept of a now you cannot you cannot know what now is if the future is already set and uh, likewise if if the past isn't set you you cannot say what the past is and and your now has no no uh, closed border to to the other direction so that's how it looks like to me. And that's how Bitcoin builds up its own internal era of time. And I'm not sure if it all translates to the physical world we're living in, but I have my suspicion that it translates quite well. <laughs> but I'll leave it at that. Right. You know, you also mentioned that, you know, exponential technologies will slap you in the face. Um, and, you know, Jeff Bezos in his 2003 TED Talk chose to use electricity as a metaphor for the web's future. All three phenomena, electricity, the internet, Bitcoin, are enabling technologies, networks which enable other things. They are infrastructure to be built upon, foundational in nature. <clears throat> and you want to you know, state that in 1995, 15% of American adults use the internet. And in some poll in 2018, 13% of respondents have used Bitcoin and its clones to pay for goods. It, this is what makes me think that you know, it, the internet took 40 or 50 years to catch on you know, really from when it was being built by the military to, you know, on, on universities and used as email systems and TCIP. And, and then things got exponential uh, in the 90s and 2000s. And I think that Bitcoin being built on the internet has an exponential platform under it. And that's why I think Bitcoin will grow faster than the internet did. So if the internet took 50 years, I think Bitcoin's going to take about 20, 25, maybe 30 years from inception. Um, so, and you also mentioned that proof of work provides a direct connection between the digital realm and the physical realm. More profoundly, it is the only connection that can be established in a trustless manner. Everything else will always rely on external inputs. And, and, and that was what really struck a chord with me, um, that Satoshi figured out how to independently agree upon a history of events without a central coordination. Um, and, and it really just is like it's creating a human clock and we just built money, a ledger on the clock the way. Uh, and I learned this from Kara Vickers that, you know, calendars were a form of, of a ledger before time was kept. Um, so it's just an astounding revelation that, that you've been able to tease out here and, and explore in a way that really struck a chord. Yeah, um, the... The part you mentioned about the exponential progress, I think it's important to point out that humans are really horrible about <laughs> thinking thinking about exponentials. We touched on it briefly before when talking about millions and billions and trillions, even though those are not uh, uh, like, uh, I mean, it's, it's also an exponential growth. It's an order of magnitude change, but 
but still, if like there, there are so many great examples, um, uh, like small riddles that you can ask people, and it just makes obvious that our brains work in a linear fashion and not in an exponential one. And networks in general work in an exponential fashion, and we uh, we we see this. We see this. Um, we saw this with the internet and, and other network technologies, and uh, we see it, of course, in computation. And it's also it's the exponential in Moore's law and in in the computational world comes from the fact that we use the previous iteration of technology to build the next iteration of technology. So it kind of loops back on itself, and uh, we're able to make ever smaller and faster and more efficient computers. And with Bitcoin, I think. Bitcoin still, even though I think it surprised a lot of people in the last six to 10 months or something like that, it will still surprise almost everyone. Like Bitcoin, as you as you said as well, is an exponential technology built up on exponential technologies. And uh, I think Bitcoin is, <laughs> is insanely underestimated. I think stuff can happen so quickly and with adoption and with use, um, the only thing that can move is the price. So uh, in terms of measuring the value of Bitcoin in fiat money, we also have the effect of uh, fiat money devaluing, not only against Bitcoin, but against everything else as well. Yeah. And, and so, so the, the exponential growth potential that's still ahead is massive. Like when, when I wrote 21 lessons, um, it was, it was, quite a bit less than it is now in terms of Bitcoin usage. And the latest reports that came out, um, they, they talk about how 10% um, use Bitcoin in the US. So we are still in the early adopter phase, you know, like it's, it's uh, like, I think even the early adopter phase starts with 12.5% officially. So we're, we're shortly before the early adopter phase. So nobody really is using Bitcoin yet. And if you look at uh, any technological adoption curve. Um, I think I have the graphs also in 21 lessons at the very end. Uh, it's always an S-curve. You know, you, you have the innovators and the early adopters first, and, and then the early majority comes in, and then the late majority, and then the laggards come in, and then everyone, like your grandma also has a Facebook and a smartphone and WhatsApp and what have you. And um, we are in the very, very, very early stages of this S-curve in Bitcoin when it comes to adoption. And if you look at the price chart, it's all, it already went parabolic a couple of times, but it's, it's completely laughable what <laughs> can and I think will still happen in Bitcoin. And I think it will get interesting when like 25%, 30%, 50% of the people will use Bitcoin and the way... I see it is that everything can happen insanely quickly because if you start saving in Bitcoin, and I think that's the most important thing you can do for Bitcoin is to start saving in Bitcoin, um, your purchasing power will grow exponentially with this adoption. Like it, it will even grow faster. Like, <laughs> like the, the value that, you, that is embedded in the token grows faster than the adoption because with every single person holding Bitcoin, it becomes exponentially more valuable. And the adoption curve itself is exponential. So you have like a, a double exponential building up on itself. And the way that innovation can happen is also, as you said before, you know, like it, it's built up on the internet and we have the infrastructure is already there. You know, like now Starlink is going online. Everyone has a smartphone. Um, you just need one app and we already have those kind of apps, you know, like we already have Strike and suddenly everyone is on the Lightning Network, for example. So it, it doesn't even take a lot of imagination to see those kind of things play out. I just think that um, most people will be insanely surprised because our brains just think in a linear fashion and not in an exponential one. Um, so I'm still <laughs> hyper bullish, but I also realize that it, it, takes, it takes a while for these kind of processes to play out because for you for for yourself to adopt a bitcoin standard your you need you either need a deep understanding of it deep conviction which correlates to understanding but i think there are also people that have deep conviction without too much understanding <laughs> and uh or what what will happen i think in the next like 5 years around the world more and more you will be forced by economic reality to adopt a bitcoin standard for yourself because your currency will devalue 
uh, there is no other way to save. Um, you have no other easy access to real estate or stocks or what have you. And the natural thing to do is um, just store your wealth in Bitcoin, the, the little wealth that you might have left. And um, yeah, I think once, once this transition really gets going, everything can happen really quickly. Yeah, I, I really like that you brought up purchasing power. I think that's the key economic term. I think for a lot of people, sometimes people feel that like, hey, if I buy Bitcoin and I don't understand it, but you're telling me this is going to help me, they, they, they intuitively think, well, I, I'm not buying something I want to use right now. And, and they don't link that this buying this thing will increase your purchasing power to buy the things you want to buy. So a lot of people might feel like, hey, I don't want to spend $10 on Bitcoin today because I really want to enjoy this $5 Starbucks. Um, and the notion of purchasing power being increased is, well, you can get 10 Starbucks you know, a year from now if you store this money in Bitcoin. So I'm really glad you brought that up. I want to I want to ask one more question to you before I ride off with two quotes of yours. Um, you know, so I think McCormack said it to you on, on in your appearance there that Bitcoin takes four years to learn your first lesson. So I'm curious, do you agree? Yeah, I think I'm inclined to give the same answer that, that I gave him or the same comment. It seems to me that there are a lot of people that came in very recently um, mm. that came in in like 2020 or, or, or late 2019 or something like that, that got up to speed really quickly. And just, you know, like Michael Saylor is one of them, for example. <laughs> and mm, it took yeah. him like three months uh, right. according to his, to, to his own... Uh, yeah, to, even to if you had a year to that, it's 16 months. Or yeah, yeah, months. It's, yeah. It's, it's definitely... I, I think he, I think he, um, he learned his first Bitcoin lesson and he did it in... But I think Less he had a cheat code. Years. I think he, uh, uh, I'm not going to, I don't want, he's a genius, obviously he's a rocket scientist, but I think he had a bit of a cheat code where he had a $500 million cash problem that was exasperating the math. So it's like, yeah. if you got, if you have 5,000 in the bank and it's being eviscerated by five, 10, 20%, it, it's more, per, it, it, it should be felt more by someone with less money, but it's seen less. It's more insidious. And I think where, you know, he had the notion where it's like he was he was spending like they were making five fifty million dollars a year in net income after, you know, after gross and paying expenses. So he's like, well, if, if, if my five hundred million is being uh, erased at 50 million a year, I might as well not turn on the lights and do all this hard work just to stay even. Um, yeah. I, I just really feel like he had a leg up in trying to in, in discovering the issue. Yeah, um, that's definitely true. But I think his real cheat code was um, uh, suffering through the stock crash of his company mm. and holding on to it. So um, mm. like he he had diamond hands before he got into Bitcoin. It's and I think, I think another benefit that he had, he's definitely um, insanely smart. And yes. uh, of course, you know, like he has a rocket scientist background and all of that. But he also... He, he's super primed for it because he understood the digital scarcity argument immediately. Like he's a huge domain hoarder and got into that very early yeah. and, and owns a lot of awesome domains as we can see with hope.com reacting yep. to his Bitcoin resources. Yep. And alarm.com. And yeah, he really <laughs> yeah, understood exactly. mobile networks and network effects yeah. and, and, and the waves of technology. That, that I will definitely stipulate. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I think, you know... Um, I think that's just the way Bitcoin adoption works, that the people that are primed for it, uh, are they, they will be the lucky ones and will come in early. And we saw that, you know, at first it was the cypherpunks and maybe the anarcho-capitalists. And again, you know, like it, it was also the people that were forced to use it, people that had to go on Silk Road uh, to, to get their medication or to buy drugs that were illegal in their jurisdiction, uh, or also the people that, that sold those kind of things. Um, so yeah, we also saw it with online gambling, like all of that was out of necessity. But if you discover Bitcoin out of curiosity, you have to be on the extremes, you know, like you had to be your overlap of what you're interested in and what how deep your understanding is in, in, in those kind of topics that Bitcoin touches on has to be very deep. And we saw, you know, like Michael Goldstein and Pierre Rochard are perfect examples. Like they were Austrian economists before they discovered Bitcoin and they understood money, uh, sound money, right. monetary right. history very, very well. And so it's kind of easy to understand Bitcoin uh, if you're open-minded for it. Like if you're a 60-year-old gold bug, maybe it's, it's harder. But if you're like 
21 or something and and uh, your mind is not set in stone yet and you already know about monetary history and Austrian economics then Bitcoin is the perfect match for you and I, I, I feel like with Bitcoin growing larger and larger it now just reaches some billionaires and some CEOs and you still need to be insanely open-minded and have a large overlap and that's yeah. where Michael Saylor comes in and also Jack Dorsey and other people I but, agree. Uh, to, to answer your original question um, I think you need to like I, I don't agree with Peter that it, it necessarily takes four years. I'm I'm also not sure if we like if these cycles stay that constant because uh, once once everyone like if everyone believes that we have four year cycles, people will start trading these cycles and then the cycles will disappear. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I don't agree with the four year I, I don't know if we're gonna always have four year cycles and, and major drawdowns. I it's interesting about the four years to learn your first Bitcoin lesson. Uh, you know, I remember when I started driving. I was told it would take five years to become a good driver, that you would need to go through certain real scenarios and, yeah. and get through them before and get tested in yeah. real life before you can be a good driver and say you can handle those things. And you have to go through the fire to say you got through the fire and you can't just intellectualize it. Um, and and I, I, yeah, I, I think that's true for Bitcoin as well. That's, that's exactly what I was about to say. I think you mm. need to understand certain things and the easiest and best but also most expensive way to learn those kind of things is to make all the mistakes so if you get wrecked in shit coins and if you get into cloud mining and if you don't run your own node and get scammed and if you type in your seed phrase into a computer and get scammed and if you lose your private keys and if you you know like there are a million different ways how to how to mess right, up in right. bitcoin and um, if you go through all those things and you learn why the mantras that bitcoiners spout are actually important um, then if you, if you do this quickly, you don't actually need four years, I think. Right. But there are some very important truths to be learned. And I think most people um, learn those kind of truths by touching the stove, myself included. Right. Yeah, the epiphany with Sailor that I really felt was crucial was, you know, he, he recognized that the real inflation was, was being captured in, in the, the really... Um, luxurious assets, you know, the, the Manhattan real uh -huh. estate, the Miami beachfront real estate, you know, there's, there's a lot of real estate in this country, but we're not always competing over the real estate, say in Ohio or Kentucky. It's really that prime real estate or the prime education like Harvard and Stanford and Yale or the prime healthcare, you know, and in my situation, you know, fighting inflation, you know, maybe the government's not acknowledging the real inflation, but I wasn't really competing for, you know, Miami beachfront property. I wasn't competing for, you know, a Harvard education right now. My, my children are young and, and I've been educated myself and I wasn't competing for, um, I'm, I'm relatively healthy. So I wasn't competing for extremely expensive healthcare where the real inflation was being captured. Yet, you know, I think he, he owns a Miami beachfront house. I mean, he's seen, you know, how it's done a 200 X in a relatively, you know, 10 or 20 years. And he is competing, I think, for those more expensive assets. So I think that gave him like, not a leg up, but just real world insight into his, to the problem that other people weren't having in, in regards yeah. to inflation. Um, yeah. So I just think that like super smart, but like he was facing that problem. And I think maybe other CEOs weren't acknowledging that. So that gives him sort of that open mindedness that you, you were talking about. I mean, he's obviously the giga Chad and, and <laughs> probably the leading speaker on the subject, which I find remarkable. I mean, I'm just blown away by his, his intellect. And his prowess. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, he has a lot of experience of talking to people and just doing sales in general and talking mm -hmm. um, in a different way to different kinds of people. So he is absolutely excellent at that. And he, you, you will see if you listen to all his um, kind of interviews and appearances, he, he will say very different things if he's uh, depending on, on the audience he's talking to. Mm -hmm. And so he's really, really good at that. But um, yeah, luckily we have many amazing speakers in, in Bitcoin nowadays. And um, uh, I think it will also go only up from there. You know, like <laughs> the orange coin has um, a, 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 like its own way of infecting the minds of people. And some of these minds will, will be like <laughs> well-trained in speaking and in thinking. And, uh, and yeah, that's... 
that's where the magic happens i think you know then you suddenly have people like michael saylor and appearing on cnbc and whatnot and just uh, telling a lot of people what this actually is about yeah and you brought up pierre and bitstein for me they're they're on the mount rushmore of bitcoin the 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 ability to yeah, grasp absolutely. it so young and with so much conviction and to have written so many pieces that have just been profound and just borne out with truth yeah. uh, really blows my mind. Um, yeah. I'm really in awe of those two. I want to read one quote from you and, and paraphrase a quote from you as we roll out here. So Bitcoin is time in more ways than one. Its units are stored time because they are money and its network is time because it is a decentralized clock. The relentless beating of this clock is what gives rise to all the magical properties of Bitcoin. Without it, Bitcoin's intricate dance would fall apart. But with it, everyone on earth has access to something truly marvelous, magic internet money. And to paraphrase you, in short, this simp is simply a podcast about Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't need this podcast and you probably don't need this podcast to understand Bitcoin. Gigi believes that Bitcoin will be understood by you as soon as you are ready. And I also believe that the first fractions of a Bitcoin will find you as soon as you are ready to receive them. In essence, everyone will get Bitcoin at exactly the right time. In the meanwhile, Bitcoin simply is, and that is enough. Gigi, thank you so much for coming on the Bitcoin podcast, Bitcoin Matrix podcast. This has been incredibly eye-opening, and I can't tell you how much I've looked forward to this since we started hashing this out in maybe November of last year. I'll leave it to you for any parting thoughts and definitely let everyone know where they could find you. Yeah, thank you, Cedric. That was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I always love to talk about those kind of ideas and, and about Bitcoin. So thanks again for having me. That, that was great. Um, people can find me uh, mostly on Twitter. Like um, when, when I'm not writing long form pieces about Bitcoin, I'm mostly shit posting on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So I'm there GG on Twitter and um, my, my Twitter handle with an edit.com is also my homepage where you can uh, find all of my writings and other links. And um, if listeners are interested in uh, the book we discussed, 21 Lessons, you can read this online for free and also listen to it online for free on 21lessons.com. You simply have to click through it and uh, you can read it and listen to it chapter by chapter. Um, it's also available on Amazon and on Audible. Uh, shout out, huge shout out to Guy Swan, who is reading all the Bitcoin things in the space and also mm -hmm. was kind enough to, to read my book and also some of my articles. And yeah, I'm also doing my best to work on my next book, which uh, is going to be called 21 Ways. And it will be about something that we talked about in this conversation as, as well. It's going to be about 21 different ways to look at Bitcoin. And one way is already published, which is uh, Bitcoin as a decentralized clock, Bitcoin as time. And this will be one of the 21 chapters of the book. And yeah, I have like five chapters written, uh, almost six, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, I, the plan is to publish it in 2021. So I still have a couple of months left and I hope that, that I'll be able to. Um, but of course, you know, like having a kid and having a full-time job is, uh, it's, it's, it's tough on the side, <laughs> writing on the side. But I, I, I plan to lock myself up a, a couple of weekends and uh, power through it and do my best to, to get it out uh, by end of this year. Well, well, mazel tov. It must be a lot of fun to be Gigi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. And uh, I've really looked forward to it for a long time. I think we have a lot more to talk about. I can't wait to have you back. Uh, I'd love to dive into some of your other articles that are already out there. Definitely Proof of Life, uh, Bitcoin's Habitats, uh, Bitcoin's Time, amongst many more. Uh, the recent piece on 21ism was awesome. And I can't wait for the new book. Uh, and we'll definitely have you back for that as well. Uh, I just really enjoyed this, Gigi. This has been so dope. Likewise. Um, thank you. And to everyone out there who is thinking about also, you know, starting a podcast, writing about Bitcoin, uh, doing whatever they, they are burning to do, just do it. You know, like I, I started with just tweeting and, and writing some, some thoughts down and uh, you, you never know what's going to happen. You know, like one of my tweets turned itself into a book and it might happen to you as well. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. I started this six months ago and it's been an incredible ride. I started with nothing and uh, I think anyone can do it. And I think that the space is growing and there's just so much more to be added and all the voices are warranted and great. So uh, I appreciate that as well. 
and if you're if, if you're just stacking sets that's of course fine too as i said before you know it's yeah. the most important thing that you can do so <laughs> keep learning and stack sets and exactly. um be private if you want that's great too I, I think i think privacy is the new celebrity so i don't think yeah. there's, you have to be public but it, you know if you want to join the conversation and, and you contribute i definitely think write speak all of that I, I agree but there's nothing wrong with just learning and stacking absolutely yeah man thank you so much gg on how Bitcoin is the language of time and money, right here on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. And thank you for listening. If you dug the chat, make sure to subscribe, write a five-star review, and share the link with your friends and family. For those of you that need to start stacking sats or want the best place to dollar cost average and get $10 of Bitcoin free on me, sign up at swanbitcoin.com forward slash Cedric Youngleman. Don't stack to be good. Stack to be great. Peace.